but uh, again, a more people coming out of closing stores. I always have to remind everybody. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Burke. I'm the head of the Infectious Disease Science Program within the VIT division. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Steve Pergam, uh, who will give you a fascinating lecture um, on infection prevention and outbreak investigations uh, in the cancer population. Steve is our, uh, our Director of Infection Control for the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, he asked me to be very brief, but I want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he got his uh, medical training in, uh, first in Nebraska, where he went to medical school, and then was trained first in internal medicine. Uh, in New Mexico, later in decided uh, after uh, uh, a brief term as a faculty member in uh, there down there in New Mexico, he decided that ID uh, infectious disease is his passion. So he came back and was trained here, became a faculty member, and is now leading our infection control uh, uh, program, which is uh, nationally uh, acclaimed. And he has a fantastic story to tell, Steve. All right, can you guys hear me okay in the back? Is that okay? I'm seeing yes. All right. Well, first of all, thank you. I, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to, to present this talk um, specifically to staff, because a lot of you sort of get to work in this environment and don't necessarily get to see kind of the background of the science and kind of what we do. And I'm a little bit different than most um, in terms of my, my research and sort of how um, I work. So I, I kind of I tried to think about a way to sort of put this all together into a a description, but I think what's one thing, if there's one um, sort of overlying principle that I try to think about is when we think about infections in cancer, what we really want to prevent is we really want to prevent a patient who is cured of their cancer of dying of a preventable infection. And when we think about the patients we put through uh, bone marrow transplant, the patients who are receiving uh, many of these novel therapies, our goal is really to protect them against things that I think in many ways we have the, the opportunities to protect. And I think what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a couple of different examples. Um, so I'll go through some, some aspects um, related to um, styles of prevention we've tried to address up front, um, how we've dealt with a outbreak and how that outbreak has led to additional science. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, in the end, uh, a little bit about communicating. Uh, because I think one thing we need to do better here is communicating science and um, particularly, I think, um, aspects that um, fight against science more recently. Um, so I think we need, to be, we need to be advocates for what we do here. Okay, so that seems really serious, I know. I'm not really that serious, I promise. <laughs> um, so as an example, I, I've, I've shown this slide a couple times, but these are the kind of questions I get all the time. So, can a transplant patient bring their favorite bird into one of our transplant houses? Um, is this hand, foot, and mouth disease? People usually sort of disrobe and show me rashes and things. Um, <laughs> what should I tell a family um, whose post-transplant children have just had a, a kid in measles, a kid with measles in their school? And this is, I think, really relevant to the current situation. Can my patient use a lavender oil mister? And what might be the risks of that? Um, I'm feeling better. <coughs> Can I return to work? Um, where we really worry about people coming back for that reason. And then, um, as I am here, um, can you give a talk on something? So I fill in that gap. So I, I often say that I wear a lot of um, costumes and hats. Um, I'm usually dressed in some sort of um, prevention. I have a mask on and usually a gown and gloves. Um, but I also have a lot of hats that I wear. And some of this, as Michael mentioned, I do. Uh, I'm using this new pointer, which is super cool. Um, infection <laughs> prevention. Um, we, I do outbreak investigation. Um, we look at antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic, uh, antibiotic use with my colleague, Catherine Liu. I spend a lot of time on education. And then I said at the, at the bottom, I, I think communication is something that is super important. And, and I think something that in every stage of science we need to improve. So infection prevention is an important aspect to sort of how we address um, patients. So the goal, the goal of this is when a patient comes through the system, the goal, what we want them to do is we want them to come through the system to not get exposed to something that they might pick up through the hospital itself. 
There are also ways that we can prevent and protect patients by ap applying specific strategies to assure that they're protected. And so I'll use um, the act one, scene one of the play. Um, and I like the fact that, you know, George, uh, that uh, Mr. Burns is bald because um, that's appropriate for me. Um, but I, I sort of say I'm a pro-vaccine ID doc sitting in my office and I'm, I'm scheming a, a quality improvement project to try to improve things. So um, we know that influenza and cancer patients is big. And I know Trevor and, um, and Jesse gave a really amazing talk about flu. I, I can't compare it to what they did, so I'm, I'm setting myself the bar a little lower. Um, but we know that in cancer patients, this is a huge issue. Um, they're the highest risk for um, death um, from seasonal influenza. An influenza vaccine um, has been shown to decrease morbidity and mortality. Much of our recent focus, however, has really been on vaccinating um, providers and not really um, as, as focused on patients and even, and, and what we'll talk about in a minute on, on um, the patients, the uh, people that are around the patients. And this is just an example in this image of a patient that developed um, influenza that ended up in the ICU for three weeks, um, costing probably $1.5 million uh, for the course of their care. We know that there are a number of flu outbreaks that happen within cancer centers that they're spread amongst many different patients. And so we have an opportunity to try to fix that. So we've done a lot, and I'll make this brief, but we've improved our vaccine policies and prevention strategies to getting all of our staff vaccinated. Um, nine, I think actually 100% of our physicians currently are vaccinated, and we have 98% plus of vaccine um, given to all the staff within the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So we do a great job of doing that. And I know everyone in this room got their vaccine, correct? Okay, good. You wouldn't be here. If you are, talk to me afterwards, I'll give you why you should. And if you, by the way, if you do have any flu symptoms, the flu uh, station is right out there. You can get tested right away. Um, so again, cancer patients have limited ability to respond to that flu vaccine because either their disease or their treatment. So when do we give vaccine is a little challenging because patients get rounds of chemo. So when is the appropriate time to, to apply it can be difficult. And then as our patients are getting better, our transplant patients now, we used to imagine they would come into the hospital, they'd be in there for 100 days, and then they'd eventually get discharged. Now, their entire transplant process is outpatient. So what does that mean for the exposure risk that they may have? So we really want to protect them in different ways. So I, I sort of liken this to what is the, um, or, or the exposure you might have in two different locations. So you think about a hospital, and an individual walking through a hospital, they may get a couple of exposures kind of passing by people that have infection. Yes, a hospital may concentrate people with infection, but if you're in your home and someone has an infection in your home, your ability to get infected is substantially more. And I think one way to think about this is if you're on a plane and you have an individual like this particular you know, person walking down, and they may expose more people with their flu than an individual would. But as a patient, would you rather be exposed to the passing stewardess or this person sitting in the seat next to you? So it's a really big difference. So the family members and caregivers that stay with their patients who are really concerned could be a place where people can gather flu. And when we think about flu and how that could potentially play a role is if we can protect them from this, we can avoid transmission in the home. And that's one thing that's small, but when it happens, it's devastating. Because when you have a family member who's passed flu on to another family member who's going through cancer care, um, this can lead to sometimes major morbidity and death and um, can obviously lead to, to major issues within families. So I went, you know, I, this was sort of an idea we'd been sort of bantering around for a while. And so we said, well, let's look at what we're doing in the clinic. And honestly, this is pathetic. Um, we gave about 600 vaccines to patients, about 96 to caregivers. And when we looked at this over years, it just didn't really change. So you know, the immediate response is, let's give provider feedback. Let's improve scripts. Let's get people engaged. We had lots of flyers. We talked about this. And you barely saw a move. It just didn't change anything. So um, at first, I went to the SCCA. And I said, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to do vaccines um, for uh, family and caregivers. And I'd like to give it for free. But that was difficult, because that's a, a financial insight. And so when they didn't want to do that, I went and said, well, what if I get Walgreens to come in and give vaccines to patients and, and to their caregivers? And so they came in for a couple of weekends and gave a couple extra. We see a, a, a slight increase, but it actually had a secondary effect, which I think was beneficial, is people felt guilty that Walgreens came in and did this, and they said, we should take this on. <laughs> um, and so I think that was great. That was sort of a subtle uh, change on my part. That was, that was 
I wouldn't say it was all predicted, but that was what I was hoping was going to happen. Um, and so then we did. We changed that, and the center actually gave us $15,000 to give free vaccine to patients, uh, families, and caregivers. And then the way we actually convinced them to do this is I had a summer student, Stephanie Price, um, who came in and created a mini questionnaire. And I think this shows you that small increments of science can have huge impacts. So we developed this collaboration where we just said, we're just going to ask patients and families about what they do. Gave it over a six-week period in the summer just to say, people get their vaccines or not. We want to know why they didn't and better information about it. And what we found was we had about 706 patients respond, about 146 providers. And we found that about 30% or around 30% of each group were not vaccinated. So we knew we had a, a potential to increase that number. And more importantly, you can see that the number at the bottom here, let's see if I can move this with any skill, stay way back, um, only about 13% of patients and about 3% of caregivers were getting vaccine through the system. So really tiny numbers. The other thing we found was that family and patients um, they really, the patients really felt like it was extremely important that they got vaccinated. It was critical. They knew that that was an important step to protect them. But when you ask the caregivers, um, a, some felt like it was important, but more often patients, felt, patients and families and caregivers did not feel like it was that important to protect their patients. So it was a real disconnect between those two sides, and we felt that was a great opportunity for education. So we also asked about why they weren't getting it and found that time and cost were 30% of the reasons why patients caregivers and families were not getting vaccine. And then when we asked them specifically if vaccine were made free, how many would consider getting it? And about 40% said yes. So again, this is a tiny study, but that allowed us to show the center why it would be important to give vaccine. And I think that's part of the reason they gave us these dollars as well. So what changed? Well, we increased our numbers by more than double. And I make this argument partially for two reasons. One, we increased the number of family and caregiver vaccines, but we also increased the number of vaccines given to patients. And the reason that happens is because they often see providers in consort. And that ability in the room to have that shared decision making and have people decide, yes, I'll do this, yes, I'll do this, um, can have a huge impact. And so we felt like it made a huge difference in both sides getting vaccine. So we had two benefits from this pro uh, procedure. And we've continued this for years. Now the center provides free vaccine for all caregivers and families regardless of cost. And that's been a huge benefit. Um, for, our, I think, our patients and, and, and particularly for our caregivers because we forget that caregivers have a tremendous burden. They're taking care of somebody who is um, going through this process and they don't have time to work out. Uh, they don't have all these other things that they have to do. So providing vaccine in the, in the clinical environment makes it much more easy to do. So a way to take on prevention that's an easy step. So I think we learned better and targeted education for caregivers is important. Um, we learned that shared decision making for vaccines is key. We targeted methods to disperse new vaccines around the center that really helped us to provide it more specifically. And we learned from these discussions how to, an to address some anti-vaccine movements that have been pre present in Seattle. A number of ways we've given staff ability and um, um, tools to sort of have these difficult conversations with patients and their families when they're not interested in vaccines. It's really been able to change how we do that. And then we think this is also a really novel way to approach new vaccines as they come through and could be an opportunity as new and, and important pathogens come along to be able to intervene appropriately. So act two, scene one, um, I'm getting ready for bed as normally I do right before I go to sleep. I check my email, which is always a bad idea. Um, and you know you're all, you're all this person, right? I mean, it's the first thing you grab your phone, you look, okay, yeah, there's the same kind of thing. And I, I saw that um, we had a startling number of paraflu cases in a short time frame. And, and I like this picture because paraflu is, <laughs> is also a motor oil, and it feels very much <laughs> like this. When you learn a little bit about paraflu, it feels very similar. Um, as I go through this process, it feels like it was just like really moving along fast. Um, and so when this happened, this was the, the this time period right here was when I became concerned. So this is what's called an epidemiologic curve, where you see each of these little bars is a number of events that happen. And we see paraflu throughout the year. It sort of shows up here and there. But we had this cluster of cases that was high number for what we would normally expect. And that was really startling to me. So I said to my team, we really need to do something about this. We need to prepare for an outbreak. I sort of called it early on. And that specific event changed what we did. But the question is, did we make a difference? And so we already do a ton. We do screening for patients coming in the door for any respiratory symptoms. We have them wear stickers to let us know that they've been screened. We have a whole respiratory management plan. We do a ton of testing for patients that come into the center to try to identify these problems. 
Um, this, we have a whole plan in action of how we screen patients. We change based on the number of events that happen. There's just a whole ton of work that's gone into this. And we've actually shown using this, this plan that we've been able to decrease um, outbreaks. So in 2008, with an RSV outbreak, when this plan was put in place, um, my, my, the former uh, infection control director could show that this had decreased o- over time. And in 2012, when there was another outbreak that we could identify molecularly, we were able to show that it didn't spread through the clinic. So we felt like we had good control of the situation based on our policies. The problem was is this is what happened. 117 different individuals got paraflu. And that's a huge outbreak. It's the largest outbreak that I'm aware of that's ever been reported. So our patients are incredibly at risk for this. And when this happens, it can have devastating consequences. Some of these patients had transplants delayed. Um, Some went on to go um, be admitted to the inpatient units. And we had at least a couple of these patients die from their illness. And remember, I knew about this, and I was able to intervene quickly But when an outbreak happens, we're always behind. By the time diagnoses are being made, sometimes the cat is out of the bag. So we have to figure out better ways to do this. So we had 97 patients. We had 17 staff. We had mostly transplant patients, our highest risk group. Um, Mostly they had upper respiratory infections, but about 14% had lower tract disease. We had multiple hospitalizations, and I said four deaths, and we had one that was clearly related to this particular outbreak. We knew it was a mixed population. If you looked at the outbreak day by day, it was a mix of patients. Some patients were either inpatient, they were outpatient, they were coming from the community. Some were these clinical staff. It was really difficult to figure out where it was coming from. But we had to do our typical, what we would say we put on our shoe leather, uh, we put on our shoes and walked around the facility um, to figure out from an epidemiologic perspective what we could see might be places that things might be happening. Problem is when we looked at patients, and I these are just an image of two different patients, one here and one here, and the number of staff that they interacted with. It's really difficult to pick one person that might have been the source. And so they're all traveling the same pathways. They often take the same bus. They go to the same procedures. This can be really tough to sort out where the primary event is. On the other side, when we look at staff, one staff member could have exposure to almost every single person in this outbreak. And you might say, well, here's our individual. But the problem is there's multiple people that look similar. And this was just someone at a front desk who actually did have respiratory symptoms and didn't have paraflu, had something else. So it can be really difficult to track down specifically where these events happen by what we typically do is going around and trying to connect the dots. So there are all these different places where people connect in an outpatient clinic that it can be difficult to pick one source or one specific event. So we looked at things that we thought we could figure out. Well, we knew that transplant numbers were super high. We knew that they were cohorting. We knew that it was mild uh, illness, um, and that maybe that mild illness initially helped to transmit, um, that by coming in with less prominent symptoms, they weren't reporting that they had symptoms. Um, Maybe staff were coming in with more mild symptoms because they didn't think they were that sick. And so it was a perfect time to come in, and only when they got sicker did they stay back. And so maybe they were transmitting during that early phase. Maybe it was that this particular strain had higher viral loads, meaning the amount of virus that was present was more able to transmit. And so we actually were able to show that that was true, and that could be one pathway by by this happening. And then since we had less severe cases, these were patients that maybe stayed in the outpatient clinic more often and had the ability to pass this around. So if you looked, one of the places we worried about was this is uh, the the blood draw area. Okay, maybe it'll work up here. Well, that's okay. I think my battery might have died on that, but I got too crazy with it early. Um, so <laughs> this is this is the front desk staff, and this is sort of the line that would go into um, getting your getting your check in, and then you'd go to this waiting room right here. Okay, hopefully you can see that. So you can see that this is like I, I've described this as like an esophagus into a stomach. So it's a really thin line going into a stomach where everyone then mixes together. And so this was a perfect place where people would come in in the morning and they could share their respiratory viruses. So you can imagine a person might walk in the door, and this is where they'd come, and then they would go to this area, and where one infected patient might have an ability to transmit to many different people in one um, specific location. And then the blue is the staff who would go in different places. You can see they could move around. What happened is as the blood draw staff got ill, it started to slow down how often people could get their blood draws. And so the wait times for the blood draw became further and further and further. And as people, as we discussed the outbreak and began to bring this up and 
you know, talk about not coming in, patients were coming earlier and earlier to avoid the rush. And so we were having these buildups that were sort of all morning and all day. So our, some, even some of the things we did to try to make, uh, to try to help this actually made things worse. And so you can imagine just the number of people that would go to this one individual place, even in a half an hour. Um, so it was really difficult, and we figured this was probably our likely source. So if we looked at percentage of patients who actually could be there for um, these different time frames, you could see, um, and this is just the number of patients in these different, um, these different time periods, but almost no one could get through in um, less than 20 minutes. So everyone was waiting longer than 20 minutes. We had a number of patients that were waiting for over an hour to get their blood drawn. So we moved our high-risk patients to the floor to, to avoid these routine draws, to get them out of that area very quickly. We limited the number of caregivers that could come with patients to decrease the potential for spread. We shifted time slots. We moved patients to preclinic or the day beforehand, um, getting them to come off hours to prevent that sort of boatload of people coming through the system. And we assured that patients came to the appropriate time slots so they didn't overload the beginning of the morning so that everything else got stuck. So we did early masking. We had staff go out in the front and catch people that had mild symptoms and say, do you have anything, before they even entered into the, the depth of the facility. And actually, we asked our staff, like many of you at the SCCA, to come do this. And many of them came back to us and said it was the most valuable thing that they've done since they've been here. They loved interacting with patients. We actually learned a lot from that process. But it was really helpful to have staff who stepped up. People that worked in the budget offices went and started screening patients because we needed that sort of support. So all of these interventions, we finally saw some decreases. But honestly, I'm not sure that anything we did changed this. I think this is, if you know anything about epidemiology, this is a classic epidemiologic curve. It goes up, and then it goes down. So I'm not sure we actually did anything, despite all of the efforts. And that's tough, uh, because I would love to be able to tell you I learned from this to figure out how to fix it. But I think we're trying to. So the act two scene two to this is that I discussed this project, and you know we have these sort of meetings with our, our colleagues where we meet and talk about science, and we um, listen to people who give lectures on different topics, and yeah, it's really a great way to introduce new faculty members. And sometimes you just sit down at lunch with somebody and have an interesting discussion. And you know I'd known a lot about genetic um, epidemiology, where we actually look at the strains of the viruses specifically, and I'll talk about this in a minute. But we had large amounts of clinical data. We had closely linked populations with community strains. We knew we had outbreak-related stuff that was from the community as well as in the actual facility itself. And we had a lot of those community strains available to compare. We had multiple samples. Um, we had patients with multiple samples. Um, we had, and then basically, we knew that genomic analyses were really uniquely suited for outbreaks. And I think Trevor and, and Jesse talked a little bit about this. Um, Trevor has the ability to sort of look at flu virus and how it changes over time. Um, between individuals and across the world, we have the abil ability to look at, from a small perspective, what happens in a hospital and how those small changes can happen over a population. And the advantage of geno genomic epidemiology is sometimes we can actually rewind the clock and figure out where the process started. At least we can tell potentially how these things um, transmit and connect together. So um, what we'd done in a prior episode is we'd looked at a, sequ a specific area of the virus um, in, a, in a virus called RSV that Helen Chu and colleagues did, um, where we could show that they were all related. But we didn't necessarily know the depths of that relationship. So what we can do now is we can do what's called whole, ge whole genome sequencing, where you can sequence the entire virus and look for small abnormalities. So as a virus has changed and passed on between individuals, it picks up small changes. And those small changes you can follow through the course of its transmission between hosts. And as those small changes happen, you can then figure out who transmits to whom. And an example would be um, in our population, we had, one, we had um, two patients that were missed on our standard PCR testing, um, our molecular tests that we would do for diagnostics, um, partially because they had a genetic mutation that where the PCR annealed specifically to the virus was not possible, it didn't, it didn't work. When we did a, another type of test, another molecular test that had a different site, it was able to pick up the virus. We knew two patients had that, so we knew those patients had to be related. So we knew there were already evidence of this happening within our population. So the first step is, were they related? So you took a number of different groups and you could show that there was relationships that suggested 
in a specific hypervariable region, an area that's constantly changing, that they were all the same, that indicated that these were all the same virus. And then, um, you know, we wanted to see, did this, uh, so we knew that was an, a definite, a unique outbreak cluster from this perspective. And this is a, a lot of work that's done by um, uh, colleagues at the UW Virology Group, specifically Jane Kuypers and, um, and um, Alex Greninger. Um, and basically what they did is they took that entire outbreak and they took components of these, of these viruses and looked at those who had high viral loads to see if there was a difference. And so we sequenced those that had high levels of virus. And within that, just from the initial look, you can see that there was at least two large clusters. So what we thought was one massive cluster that everyone had was actually likely two major introduction events. Within that, you can see that there was these smaller clusters where people were related. And each of these little branches shows relationships. So this major branch here is a breakpoint where these are all related, but these smaller branches indicate smaller relationships between individuals. So now we're getting to the point where we have the ability to look at this data more specifically. The moment um, we are linking all of this to epidemiologic data, we've pulled all of the um, visits and patients' uh, interactions with staff members. It's over 3 million lines of code. It wasn't actually something we could put on a thumb drive. Um, it's now on the cloud because it's so much information. And we're using this data um, together with this genomic analysis to try to figure out where these clusters happen. Um, we're um, doing this evolutionary analysis to better understand um, how transmission patterns happen and maybe identify transmission patterns that might have been missed by us. Were there places where transmission was happening that we weren't aware because all we had were sort of basic epidemiologic tools? And then we're, we're comparing this to um, sequences in the community to see how different they are and to, to better understand how that might happen. And then I think our really, you know, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to figure out how this data can be used to prevent uh, future interactions and future outbreaks. I mentioned that I saw the initial group and I saw this initial start. How can we identify this early? How can we identify a sequence of events before it becomes a major outbreak? Is there a way that we can do this in a short time frame that can help us to prevent outbreaks like this from happening again? So we're beginning to plan for modeling studies that could help us to identify ways to better understand when, um, when an event like this happens. And that's work that's done with uh, John Sugimoto, uh, Betts Halloran, and Natasha Wenzel and, and their group. And so we've got a lot, of, a, a lot of trials to look at this diverse data, and I, I'm hoping that in the future we can simulate an outbreak. The other thing we can do with this data, and um, things we're beginning to discuss now, is how can we use what we've collected in all of the interactions and all of this information to model a future pathogen, one that has potential major impact in our population. We've talked about measles, we've talked about um, bird flu, we've talked about others, how we could put that into this model selection and understand better what would happen if we had one of these events. And I think that's really critical because we want to plan in advance. We want to figure out where the problems are. We want to be able to be there before we have a cluster like this size. And I think it's, I, I, again, I, I think this is a great example of how interaction should happen between scientists. It's talking about what's happening in your world. It's talking about people that are doing research that's related to you or sometimes totally unrelated to you and figuring out how you can do this and how you can move that forward. Um, so I got a call from a PA um, with a, a friend with a question. Um, this is act three. So it was a patient with refractory leukemia, was on a clinical trial and had been on many episodes to the inpatient unit at the UW. Um, and was, had been at home in Seattle, wasn't staying at any of our specific locations in here, had been on a specific antifungal agent, an anti-mold agent called voriconazole, for a common um, mold infection called aspergillus, had prolonged neutropenia, meaning their cell counts were very low, and was admitted to, <clears throat> admitted to the clinic in July with neutropenic fever, meaning they had fever associated with low cell counts, and then um, new cough and chest pain. And they had this abnormality when seen on CT. <coughs> So this looks like a new fungal infection, this, this common uh, finding. And so what this is, is this is a CT scan of the chest. This is the um, right side of the chest, no, excuse me, left side of the chest. And um, this right here is this area that should not be present. It's this kind of fuzzy area that you could imagine a mold might look like. Um, the, the BAL, or a bronchial velar lavage, um, demonstrated uh, Rhizopus microsporus or azygosporus, which is a, a fairly rare um, type of mold, a mucor species, that is highly deadly. 
This patient was started on another antifungal and then moved to hospice care very quickly, um, partially because of this infection and because of their underlying disease. But what was troubling, again, is that um, a few um, days later, we had a second patient that showed like this. And this was the early um, image on Friday. Um, you see a little bit of what's called a reverse bird's nest here, where you see sort of the out, outer area and then a, a central clearing in the middle. And then um, within, um, by Monday, this was the appearance. Um, that patient was taken directly to surgery. Um, this was their lung resection. Um, that area in that's red, um, here is the mold that is invading the lung. Um, I'll tell you, it's as hard as a nail. We went down to pathology and feel this. So it's really difficult to treat. Um, it was probably centimeters from involving both lungs. And if we hadn't taken it out, it would have um, spread. Um, this um, has an appearance that you can see these are the black are these mold uh, filaments that are sort of invading into the tissue. And so these are devastating infections. They typically re require surgical intervention um, um, to cure. And so rhizopus species, it, again, it's a mucorales specific species. It's ubiquitous mold that's everywhere, found in decaying fruit and vegetation, grows very rapidly to sort of blow the top off a petri dish. Um, and it's really linked to severe disease, where we typically see it in our high-risk immune compromised patients, where they're on, they have high levels of iron, they have prolonged low cell counts, they have steroids, and they're on um, sometimes this drug called voriconazole. But it's really hard to determine how these transmission patterns happen. It can be really difficult. And having two cases was concerning. So we went back and looked. And during June, July, and August, you can see in red, we had a cluster of seven cases. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a massive number. And you can see we have these sporadic cases throughout other time points. But having seven at one time frame was, was troublesome. So I had um, Shobini. Um, who was a um, visiting scientist from Australia and sort of dive deeper into the details. And we really tried to understand sort of why this was happening. So we looked at where patients were. They'd been in a number of ICU beds because they were um, critically ill. Went to other floors, it was everywhere. They'd been in and out of these different areas. So there wasn't one specific location that we could identify, oh, there's mold on the wall, that must be the problem. We couldn't identify a specific source. So you might ask, you know, what's the challenges of mold? Well, unlike something like flu, where I know when you get infected, when the time frame typically occurs when you start getting ill, mold infections are not this way. Um, they, there's no incubation period. We never know when the exposure happened. Sometimes people have colonization in their lung. Other times, people can get a new exposure that we wouldn't necessarily gather. And all of these patients are at risk. So how do you figure out where the links are when everyone has the same issues? We often link it to construction. But we didn't feel like there was any construction in any of the hospitals to suggest a connection. We weren't sure where we missed others that didn't actually uh, develop more severe symptoms. And when we look in air samples, we often miss it because if there was an event, we might not capture it in real time. So we walked through the clinic. We went to the inpatient units. We did our assessment of our airflow systems. We looked at air handlers. We looked at when things were assessed. We looked at when um, positive cultures were. There were none that were related to this. We did outdoor samples. Um, we looked at where they pressure washed the garage, thinking it might blow up mold spores in the air. None of that was related. Um, we even went through construction and looked um, specifically at this. Um, um, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, we actually looked, we, we wondered, could this a new test be associated? And we found a huge number of increase in tests, but that was linked more to once the outbreak was found that the test was being ordered more frequently. So we did not feel like that was the etiology. And we looked at construction. I don't know if any of you can remember a time that you've walked around Seattle when there's not been construction, <laughs> right? So this is an example. This little thing here is the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And this is a heat map showing you all of the construction that was happening. So we went out to the city, these are available. You can get construction records. And we mapped out exactly where construction was happening, both at UW and at, um, at uh, the SCCA, and could find no connections. There was just construction all the time. So there was no ability for us to determine any particular links to that. So you wonder, we did this molecular testing with um, viruses. Is this possible to do with fungi? Well, fungi is much more difficult. These are very diverse organisms. And in outbreaks, they're often multiple strains. So it can actually be very difficult to do this. And multiple groups have tried to figure out how to do this. There's a really nice paper that reviewed this in detail, where during a burn unit, where they had an, an isolated event, where they knew where the, the, the exposure was, 
there, every single patient had a different strain of mold, and so it was difficult if you tried to figure this out by individual to individual, even sequencing the entire, uh, the entire organism was not possible. So we didn't have this as our backup system to be able to link. We did, however, have other data. So what we always do is we go to the literature, and we found that mucor was more common in the summer months. Um, and we'd seen this from Lebanon and Israel. Interestingly enough, it's, not a, it's the way I figure uh, Seattle is a desert. But I do think with global warming, this is becoming something that is important. And we thought that could be part of this. Um, we looked at, we wondered, could there be different types of construction that have in the summer months? Is this digging in the ground at specific times? Is this related to um, when people begin projects? We weren't sure. Um, I, I'm not going into this. I've developed a whole line of research related to marijuana, partially because of this question, because I cu was curious whether marijuana use could be linked to, um, to this particular issue. And that's a whole other topic for another time. Uh, but the answer was no. We didn't find that that was a link either. Correct. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Mold on the plant. Yeah. Um, and then if, if you look, if you look uh, this Weather Channel, I don't think has this anymore, but they used to track mold spores in the air. And I don't know what mold spores they're tracking. But you can see that it's much higher during the summer months than in the winter when it's almost um, negligent. And so we thought this could potentially be a pathway as well. And when we looked, um, we did a review. And then by the time we were finishing putting pieces together, we had the summer come again. And we had another large cluster of six patients or five patients again. So when we map this out with temperature and, and um, total precipitation, you can see um, in the periods when temperature was above 20 centigrade um, were the periods when we had the largest clustering. And that was also periods when uh, rain was the lowest. And um, I think what's really interesting is summer, if you compare it to spring, was nearly five times the rates of mucor infections. So we felt like summer was an, increase, an interesting link and we were able to publish this, and I think others have picked up on this modality as well. So a really interesting new move. And I, I kind of wonder, is this something that's a new problem around the country? And the reason I, I come to that is, is Act 3, Scene 2, is I go to present this data initially when this first happened at one of the major infectious disease conferences. And it hadn't been finalized. We were working on some basic data. Um, but I had multiple centers come up to me and say, we have the same exact problem you're having. And so, the CDC came up, talked to me. They said, we are going to all these places to investigate. What do you think this is? And my response to all of them is, why aren't you here presenting your data? This would be great to be able to see this. But no one wanted to talk about it because it was a major issue. So the next conference I go to, I often ask a simple question. Um, what are you concerned about? And um, we had Legionella at the time, so I talked about that. Um, and they mentioned that they were having a lot of these rhizopus cases that were similar to ours. And I said, well, that's inter interesting. I'd like to know more, because we've had similar issues. Um, they had a PhD student from Pitt who was doing um, some analysis there. And we, um, through that conversation, got involved in a research project. Um, we, um, I was able to get them to talk about this um, here and, and then at a, at a national meeting. But this led to another possibility that we had not considered, and that was linen. And so this is now a study that's published um, that was multiple cancer centers. And what they did is they looked at hospital linen as a potential source. At their center, they were able to go to the linen center, and they could actually culture this organism from the roof of the linen facility. And then what would happen is it would infect the linen. They would give the linen to patients, and the, linen, uh, the patients would get infections. Um, we actually had them come test. Um, multiple different sites. This isn't ours. This is multiple different centers. Unfortunately, they came in November, which I think we didn't have really a lot. So we're somewhere down on the end. We didn't have any mold. But other centers up to, um, and if you look at Mucorali species, this dark gray, um, sometimes up to 25% of all linen that was tested had this organism on it. And these are patients that 70 to 80% of them who developed this infection die. So really incredible data. Now, what do we do with this? It's a grand question that we're all debating. Um, it's a really tough question, and I don't think we have answers to it yet. But it's opened up an, a major area of interest. Um, and I think right now, the CDC is working towards hopefully getting a group together to sort of address these particular mold infections in detail. And I can say, since this presentation, and since this paper, and since the prior paper that we published, there's been five different centers that reached out to me with um, information saying, we want to know what you humorous. <laughs> 
I know, you know, it's funny, when I, I talked to somebody else, we do, I talked to another group about this recently, and they were like, okay, thanks for terrifying me. That's not why I'm doing this. Um, I'm just giving you examples of sort of what we do. Um, so here is, is, is a case that maybe is a little more humorous, and probably many of you might have relationships to this in a funny way. Um, so I was reviewing cases with a colleague um, by phone, um, which we do sometimes. Um, and they noted they had a patient on service with listeria, uh, monocytogenes, which is a food-borne bacteria. Um, often, um, many different pathways to get this. There's been outbreaks with um, um, melons. There's been outbreaks in food sources, oftentimes associated with meat, but um, lots of different ways that people can get it. And we had a patient with multiple myeloma who developed it, but had been inpatient for four weeks, which was a, a little bit unique because it suggested that that event happened in the hospital. And so my response was, thought that was unusual, told them to call the laboratory and double check there wasn't other cases, and sure enough, there'd been another case that had been recently diagnosed in a solid organ transplant recipient. And so what this led to was an outbreak of um, Listeria monocytogenes. They did a full workup. The CDC and the, the state, uh, Seattle King County come in and do it, investigations. And they um, sort of went through all of the situations with the patient. They tried to figure out what they ate and what they didn't eat. And they determined that these patients used a lot of milkshakes. And these milkshakes were used for increasing their protein content and increasing their calorie content, which is we use a lot of times in cancer patients. And what happened is it was the ice cream product that was put into the, pasteurized, into the machine that was supposedly pasteurized that led to this listeria outbreak within the hospital. So the product that was um, purchased from a, uh, somebody in the community was brought in and led to this. Now, that seems like not a very interesting story. It's not just by that alone. It is cool that our patients can do this. But what's more important is what happened to the entire Seattle system. So I didn't know this, but nearly every Seattle ice cream shop was closed. I don't know if you remember this. So it was back in 2014, but there was a Molly Moon, all these other places. I thought they made their own ice cream, but they use a stock product from Snoqualmie, um, ice cream that developed, um, that um, made this product that we were using in the hospital. And unfortunately, they all, um, they found Listeria at the primary site where this was being produced. So everybody closed their ice cream systems. So the majority of ice cream shops in Seattle use this as a base. And as you can see, the manufacturer um, produced products that went all over the United States. Now, we never could find out whether there were others that were infected, but how important was it that we were able to do this investigation before it spread to multiple others around the country? This facility was shuttered for a while and then revamped. They did a lot of work to fix it. There had been all kinds of warning signs that had been ignored for a long period of time when you go back and read these articles. Um, but it is now up and running again. And I thought what was interesting for me is when this all happened, of course, I went to my fridge, and this is what I had in my fridge. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, was a little dis dis I was a little disgruntled, but uh, I, I, put the, I put the receipt up there because I actually, when I went to the grocery store to get my receipt, it actually on the top said, warning, you've purchased a, pro a, pro a product that's been recalled, and, which was really fascinating. I had never seen that before, and I was like, wow, that's cool. You know. So take a look at your receipts, yeah, all right? Um, so you think that's really interesting, very cool. Maybe that's the end of the story, but it's not. Um, so the scene two is this. I got a surprise email in my box. My email box never has one on it, by the way, but that's OK. Um, so Steve, we have a new case of Listeria on the inpatient service. Didn't you present this in the last year? What was the source? And Jim Boone, I think, is in the crowd here someplace. Maybe he snuck away. Um, but he was in, involved in this patient and asked some questions specifically to this. And it was a cancer patient who, again, had acquired this organism on the inpatient service. Again, was noted to be eating lots of ice cream. When they sequenced it using that molecular whole genome sequencing, they were able to say it was exactly the same strain as a year before. But the problem was is we changed ice cream manufacturers. So how was that possible? Well, they could then link it to the machine itself. So despite having this machine cleaned, I don't know how many times, it was in the system. And so they were persistently contaminated milkshake machine this time. So this was reportable. They made major changes in how these things are done. And they've um, got a whole new ice cream machine at this point in time, as you can imagine. Uh, but I think a really interesting way that these processes can change practice in how we do things. So this is a, we're able to share this data across the nation and be able to fix that, I think. All right. So the last bit, and I've got about, I'll make this about five minutes, and I'll stop with 10 minutes left. How about that? All right. Um, so taking a leap, and I, I want to get into communication. So I'm lecturing to you guys. There's a number of you here. Um, I, of course, what do I do? I, I also go around the world, around the country, and give talks in different ways. 
Um, and I think it's great that we can do this. I, you know, you've heard me say it's great to go to meetings and have these conversations. But in order to change public, imp uh, to public um, opinion and to really weigh in on these major issues, to get people interested in research, to get people interested in coming and being involved in clinical trials, to get people interested in getting their vaccines. Um, these are important aspects that we should be spending more time doing. And so I decided um, that I would do something else. So this is um, the map of where people follow me on Twitter. I don't have a huge Twitter following, but it doesn't matter. I've used social media as a way to sort of talk about this more. Um, you saw at the beginning of my talk, I have a Twitter handle. I do that on all my talks now. Um, it can be a way to really spread ideas more virally that I think can be really helpful. We, there's a lot of people that have talked about the use of Twitter and its use in medicine. These are just some examples from ID. I, I particularly like the review of Twitter for infectious disease uh, clinicians useful or a waste of time, uh, but it is useful. I find articles, interesting things all the time that I would never find through other mechanisms. And I encourage people that are interested in science to spend some time doing this because it is really interesting to see what people say that is absolutely not factual. The things that people say that are quite dangerous for patients and for many of us. And then the great science and interesting things that people talk about that can really open your eyes to new areas and directions that I think can be quite interesting. So as an example, you can track articles and social media interactions. So now there's, an, there's something called an alt metric or alterna, alternative metric for articles where it's not just about who references you, but also where you're talked about. Facebook pages, which I don't even have a Facebook account anymore, but um, where it's been tweeted and where people are talking about it. it can be very helpful for you to see where your science is being disseminated. I'll give you a couple examples. So a FedEx package arrived around, around Christmas time, and I didn't remember that I had ordered anything. And what happened is um, a company had seen a article that I had tweeted that Mary Engel, who used to work here and write for the, the center, had written about flu. And in that article, I'd said that um, that zinc lozenges in one study had been shown to potentially be effective, but they tasted terrible. And so <laughs> this was the company <laughs> sending me a response that said, we wanted to send you this care package because our zinc lozenges are not only palatable, but are great tasting. <laughs> if you have any questions, wishing you well. And I thought this was hilarious. So they actually found this on Twitter. They found it, and they reached out to me specifically through this mechanism. I, I just thought it was great. I mean, I got a, I, literally, I got a FedEx package, and I was like, what? And I was like, what? I still have this in my office, because I've never tried them, by the way. That's okay. <laughs> um, and then as an example, um, this was a colleague who was giving a talk who um, asked all of us to reach out to her and, and say, can you just say where you're from? And I wanna, I'm talking to my students. I want to show them how much um, this has played a role. And she had, I think, 300 different people from around the world respond uh, over a single day that she could show to her students the impact of just that single statement. I actually thought about doing it before the talk today, but just didn't have time because I got uh, sat, uh, waylaid with other things. But just interestingly, to see where, this, where you can spread um, an, a message like this. And then here was an example. I gave a talk at Northwestern about marijuana um, where um, someone reached out and said, I saw a lot of reaction to your talk at Northwestern on Twitter. Would you be interested in having us do a piece about that specific area? So getting out there, this is um, a, you know, Hemonc Today, which is um, a, a paper that's sent all over the United States related to cancer. You know, is this a place where we want to be? We want to be in the front. We want to be getting our science out there. This can be a great way to expand the horizons we have. So all of you who work in labs, talk to your team members about this, because I think it can be really valuable. Um, it's led, um, I think, in many ways, awareness of new outbreaks. Um, it's led me to new papers, finding new research and investigators. I've interacted with faculty and students with similar interests. Um, I have um, seen others do um, virtual journal clubs on Twitter. Uh, it really has helped me to hone my message so that I can be more clear and concise. When you have a short amount of characters, and if you know me, I'm a blabbermouth, so making it really tight is, is really important. Um, so it's really been helpful from that perspective. I can also follow conferences from a distance and see what's going on, so I can hear about a new trial that's being unveiled in Europe that I can't see. Um, it's allowed me to get invited to conferences and to other places that otherwise I might not have known about, and they didn't know about my science and the things that I do. It's also been a great way for me to promote my students and team members, to help them find jobs, to really elevate their science, to let people know of the amazing work they're doing. It's a great way for everyone to see that kind of input. 
And then I think it's been a good way um, to talk with and advise media members about specific things. So as an example, I don't know if you guys all saw this, and I didn't save this as, as a specific, um, but the Seattle Times, when they talked about measles, they had a picture of a child getting a vaccine. And the image was just, it, the child looked terrified and awful, and the needle was gigantic. And, <laughs> and so all of us responded to Seattle Times and said, this is an inappropriate picture to be using for a major public health intervention. And they changed their picture. So these are small things that can have huge impacts. So I think it's really important. We can advise media members. They can reach out to us for input. Um, and I think we can really help shape science in a different way than I think I've been able to do in any other way. Um, so I think that's it, guys. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh, it, I, I, I should say, I, I should have switched. I should have switched the other way around. But I have an amazing team, and this picture is out of date. Um, there's others in the crowd that I, that I don't have in this picture, and some that have graduated and moved on. But I've worked with a ton of different people. As many of you who are in this crowd, uh, none of the work I can do is without the team members that I have and the, and the wonderful, um, amazing collaborators I have at Fred Hutch. So everyone who's doing work here, whether you're working in the budget office, whether you're doing communications, whether you're working in a lab, you're incredibly important to the science that happens here. So all of these people are incredibly important to me and have really helped me be able to shape um, the science that we do. And just so you know, this is, uh, I always have an artist do a, uh, an image of us every year. And so this was, this was us this year. So look, look forward to next year. We have a more crazy one. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, that's a great question. So actually, um, one of the centers that had an issue with this um, sent their laundry out for gamma radiation um, to deal with it. It's incredibly expensive. Um, so the problem is you can't put filters on, um, on laundry facilities, because when you have a dryer and a filter on it, can can increase fire risk. So it can be very difficult to do. So there's some specific steps that you can do um, to, to limit the risk. So they go through, they, click, uh, they clean up all the, uh, the dander um, and that sort of that leftover fuzz from um, cleaning. They increase their cleaning. Um, they go to the roof. They widen down all the areas. They clear the areas where the air intakes are. Um, they, there's a lot of th small things that they can do to decrease that risk. I'm not sure it can get to zero. I mean, these are massive facilities that process um, hospital laundry. So it's difficult to make it perfect, I can say that. Um, I don't think in an individual household this is an issue. If these are really industrial complexes where this is a problem. But there are some small steps that they can take to, to decrease that risk, yeah. Yeah. As a follow-up question, has yeah. anybody discussed um, changing the material of the sheets to something that's less hospitable? Yeah, so the question was, is, has anybody changed anything about the sheets to make it something less hospitable? Yeah, there's been discussion of. Um, doing uh, poly blends as a decrease risk. There's some thought that maybe the different, uh, the breakdown of the, you know, sort of polyester versus cotton or pure cotton uh, might decrease the risk of these pathogens. We don't know yet, but that's that's certainly in the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. So I would actually just was reading an article a couple of days ago about this whole thing with the vaccines mm -hmm. and the recent study that came out of I think it was Denmark. Yes, Denmark. That's right. Yeah, and one of the things they said in that is that that science doesn't seem to convince anybody, you know, that, yeah. that it's like even more, the more, and, and I, you know, my son has a disability, so I'm mm -hmm. familiar with the disability yeah. community, gets sure. obsessed about this, yeah. and I, we know yeah. people who are convinced that that's what caused their child's yeah. autism, and I, it's like, how do you get to people who, who just really won't hear the science? Um, yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, I think you, it, there's all kinds of ways to do this. First of all, I think we have to be passionate. We have to sort of believe in the science. We have to understand that the concepts we're talking about are things that are important. I think it's also really important um, that usually when people have a strong held belief, there's often reasons behind it. It's they've had someone that's had a side effect from a medication. They've had a side effect from a vaccine. They've known someone who's been in a situation. So you have to address those first and understand what is the reasons. Um, I think it's important to bring up science, to bring up papers and say, this is what we've seen. You know, when that Denmark study you're talking about related to MMR and, and autism, if anything, shows that MMR decreases the risk of autism, um, although minimally so. Um, and it's 500,000 plus children. It's massive. So what else do we want? Um, 
I think it's also sometimes hard. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about this. People think that you know I'm getting paid by the you know vaccine industry to talk about these things. It's really hard. Um, so I think you need to take every person you meet with and have this discussion and have a one-on-one -on -one about this. I think we also need to change national policy. We need to make this much more difficult for people to say no. Because when we're talking about protecting the public, there are certain aspects of how we do this and how vaccines are used. When my parents uh, grew up, um, if you got a fever, you might, in the summer, you might have polio. And so they, uh, the minute polio was available, they ran to get polio vaccine. We've lost that because we just don't see these things anymore. And so I think we really need to move in the other direction where we need to, to remind people that these are necessary. We've done this with other diseases. We mandate you know, TB evaluations. We mandate that um, people are followed for directly observed therapy. There are ways to do this. Um, we need to change our policies to make it easier, to make it much more difficult to get out of getting vaccines. I think that's a really important step. And you've seen that in California where they've made this change and you've seen the rates of, of, of vaccine um, declinations go down substantially. So I think if you address a lot of these things on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you change policy, I think you can really begin to, to make some progress. But it's always hard. And it's individual. You have to take the time to do it. I got a follow-up. Yeah. How do we get that? It's a follow-up question. How do we get that message across to our employees that aren't getting vaccinated? Because I still remember people think they're going to get the flu. Yeah. Well, you know, as I've said, and you know I volunteer this all the time, I'm happy to come talk to you guys whenever. I can give every scenario of bad, of bad cases. I can show them examples of normal people who've had devastating illnesses um, from flu. I can give them examples of the data that suggests that you know, flu is beneficial. I can show them information. I, I, you know, there's plenty that's there. And I think it's important to address it. So I often give people the opportunity to say, you know, I understand where you're coming from. You're concerned. You have symptoms. But let me tell you why it's beneficial. And what about trying it this year and seeing how you feel? And then let's follow up on it. Why don't you, you know, have them come talk to me directly and I can give them that information. Because I also really encourage people to think about the entire system. It's not just about themselves, but they work at a cancer center. And that every single person who enters this facility, the SCCA and others, there are patients walking around here all the time. And you don't want to be in a situation where you get sick and give, give it to somebody else. So I think that's really important too. But I, I encourage you to keep talking about it. I've changed countless minds um, over this. I can't say I'm always able to, uh, but uh, I definitely do take the time to talk to people about it. And I think if you do, you show that you care, I think it is a, it's a big step in that direction. OK. Stunned into silence, OK. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. <laughs>